Thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, my privilege and pleasure to be here with you today. I've, I've really enjoyed listening to a lot of the talks and the, uh, the activities. Um, I'll try to give you just a little bit idea of what's going on board Space Station every day um, and, and maybe make you think about things in a little bit different way than, than the ways you normally do. So uh, first of all, I'll just start off with this cover picture. For me, this is really captures a pretty unique image. This is really what we're about. We change our perspective of the Earth. If you see the auroras there, uh, you can see Space Station in the background. Uh, again, I think by leaving the home planet, going to space, it really changes your perspective. And, and I think that's an important thing. And that's, there's a human aspect to that that's different than the robotic spacecraft. When I see images from space, I can generally tell if the picture was taken by a crew member or it was taken by a satellite. And, and the, the images are reflect that human piece where they're looking for a particular aspect or a particular angle of the picture that is more artistic or, or tries to capture a feature on the Earth. Uh, this is just another picture of station. Another thing that's amazing to me is I was privileged to be around from the very, almost the very beginning of this thing, uh, back in, in the early 80s. Uh, it's absolutely phenomenal what research facility we have in space. And, and you've got a chance to talk about it, and it's now up to, to you and to us to really take maximum advantage of this. We have an unbelievable research facility. It's pushed the boundaries of international cooperation. Um, it carries a whole different variety of research from, from biology to high energy particle physics to earth observation. Just an amazing facility. And, when I, when I look at this image, I, I just marvel at, at how much perseverance it took for us to actually put this spacecraft together and put it into space. It was, it was not easy. And we're really making that transition from all that energy that went into assembling it is now going into how can we utilize it and, and get the most effective use of the space station as, as we go forward. So just a phenomenal, phenomenal facility. Um, I got this chart from Julie Robinson, and, and this is the way I kind of think of station that, that she put together. And there's really three major kind of functions. You can think about discovery kind of research, and that's basic or fundamental research, um, similar to maybe what the AMS is, is looking at. Then there's research that we're doing for space exploration, and that's the things you're talking about here at this conference. How do we keep humans in good condition for a long duration that we're gonna be required as we go off and do exploration? And then there's another piece that's kind of geared towards Earth benefits, where station is uniquely postured to directly benefit people on the Earth, and, and out of that comes some research benefits and spinoffs. And I think what happens is some of these areas overlap. You know, clearly the, the space exploration area overlaps with Earth benefits. Some of the problems that, you know, we're solving or you're trying to solve for long duration space flight, bone loss, uh, some uh, the muscle wasting and, and uh, immune system changes, those will have direct benefits back on, on people on the Earth. So there's a, clearly a tie between these different pieces. But I think this is a good way of talking about station in a generic sense and talk about it as these three types of distinct research that are interrelated, but yet they're all there and they're all present on board the space station. This is a, another thing that's occurred with station is we, we got station assembled and built and uh, we found out we had extra capability on board station. We just didn't get the research funding on the NASA side to effectively fully populate the station with research. So roughly 50% of the space station uh, research capability, that's rack space, volume space, it, it cannot be used by the funding that NASA has going into those research activities. So we created with uh, Senator Hutchinson a, a portion of the space station we call the Na National Laboratory. And what we're doing there is we're working with a, a, a group, the Center for Advancement of Science in Space, the CASIS organization. And they're going out and they're talking to commercial entities and pharmaceutical companies and other folks that might be interested in doing research in space to see if there's another interest beyond just the government research. Is there a real, maybe more of an applied application of what we're doing in space? Can the microgravity affect uh, that we see um, be applied uh, commercially uh, in some ways in the pharmaceutical area to help with maybe new, some new drugs, uh, other things along those lines. Also, um, 
on our Earth observation activities? Could they fly a new sensor to space station, check that sensor out on space station, and then commit it to a, a geosynchronous satellite later for more dedicated Earth observations? And what we're seeing is uh, this is kind of a split between how much interest we're seeing outside of government-funded research and how much is um, kind of private sector research. In the biology and biotechnical area, you know, this is kind of a notional chart, but it's roughly 50-50 kind of split, uh, you know, where there's, there's a lot of interest in, um, you know, salmonella vaccines, uh, the, the, the genes uh, differentiate a very different way on board are in space for some reason. They can exploit that to look at potentially new, new, uh, new vaccines for, for various uh, bacterial things. So there's, there's quite a bit of interest in, in that area. Then the human research, that's really geared mostly all towards what you're talking about here today. It's all long duration spaceflight activities to go do exploration kind of distances and that falls predominantly on the government side. Physical sciences, we're starting to see a little bit of interest on, on the outside. There's some uh, the folks that want to go monitor some, some physical phenomena, some high energy particle physics kind of stuff from more of a space weather standpoint. Uh, technology demos, again, those are more on the side of NASA because we're using station to, uh, you know, essentially build the next generation of life support system that'll go into spacecraft that'll be used to go to Mars or to other farther distances. Um, we just uh, upgraded some communication systems. Uh, we're looking at to pretend, a laser device will fly up next year to do laser communications with the Earth, so we'll actually get a chance to go look at laser communications use in station. So there's quite a bit of interest on our part. Astrophysics is, again, predominantly almost all NASA. Earth science is about 50-50 split. Um, we're starting to see a, a lot of Earth science come now to the space station that was not there before. Um, the uh, the uh, orbiting carbon observatory, the OCO experiment, will fly as a dedicated satellite, and then they effectively took their spare equipment that was built when they manufactured that satellite, and they're going to fly that to space station, and it will be on space station next year. And what's really nice about that is their satellite is in a sun synchronous orbit. It looks at carbon generation at roughly the same time every day, so that's good from a science standpoint. It's statistically accurate. They know where it is. Then station because it's in the this other orbit, it essentially will look at that same region at varying times of the day. So that data is extremely complementary. So they'll get a chance to look at carbon generation at various times throughout the day and see if carbon generation changes throughout the day. But then the basic stable data is there from that dedicated satellite. So you're going to see that for, for carbon uh, uh, generation. You'll see it also in aerosols with a, uh, an experiment. And then there's also another one, rapid scat, which looks at essentially uh, winds in front of hurricanes and wave sea state that will also fly to station. So I'm starting to see now a whole big range of Earth observation and Earth science experiments on station that I had never seen before. The science mission director is, is, is essentially taking their spare components after they get through their, their manufacturing and they're assembling those into a, to, into a little package. They get them to station, the power is available, the data is available, and they can do tremendous things. Then the last thing is education. We do a fair amount of outreach and education to, to get students excited. We have the SPHERES program on board station where uh, they essentially students, it's like a first robotics competition, except it's done in space, where they're given a task to go do with these satellites that fly in formation on the inside of space station. High school students actually pro program those satellites, and they compete, uh, again, with other universities and other folks in kind of a competition to see how well they can program. So that's an extremely great thing to see, essentially high school kids doing kind of college-level work in some sense to experiment and, and get exposed to space. So. This is a lot of the research that's going on in board station. These are some you know, kind of major examples or findings. I, I won't spend a whole lot of time with these. You, you could just read these. Um, you know, one was this black hole uh, uh, swallowing a star, and that got published in Nature. Uh, I made the mistake of talking at a, a conference in, uh, in CERN about this and saying how this was such a big deal, and they told me they see this all the time. And so then I kind of shot my, my, uh, my bubble there, burst my bubble. But then, but the important thing there was it was a, a Japanese experiment that looked at the entire sky. It saw something strange going on in one region. They communicated that information to another 
very pinpoint precise instrument like Swift, and it actually maneuvered and looked and actually captured this activity. So I like this as an example of supreme international cooperation where an instrument that is, that is really looking at a broad all scale or all sky image teams now with a team with an instrument that can only look at one pinpoint in the sky but get tremendous data there by those folks working together through the international space station they got a, a, a richer result that wouldn't have occurred if they would have done it individually on their own um, i call this a discovery you guys just had the entire session about this one so i won't talk to you about that uh, that's the uh, vi the vision uh, impacts and intracranial pressure uh, the microbial virulence uh, that was published in, in the National Academy of Science, that's dealing with uh, salmonella. Then some potential earth benefits. You can read these here again. Um, uh, they're, they're pretty amazing things. We're starting to see inklings of these things, but then to, to, you find the discovery and then to actually turn it into practice or turn it into a drug takes a tremendous amount of time. So. We'll see how much we can focus on this and how much um, advancement we can make. On the exploration side, for us, we clearly see life support and reliability and maintainability as being a key thing we can demonstrate in, in addition to all the things you talk about, the behavioral activities, uh, the uh, long duration space flight. Um, bone health is clearly important. And then I put the alpha magnetic spectrometer on, on this list. Uh, Sam will talk to you about that uh, a little bit uh, this evening as your, as your speaker. I put it under exploration because this gives us a chance through this instrument to also understand the cosmic background radiation, which is important to understand that environment um, and uh, as we need to protect for it as we discussed. And then as Sam very um, eloquently sh showed you this morning, off of this alpha magnetic spectrometer, this uh, superconducting magnet can be essentially a, a shielding technique for, for crews. So again, even though it's a pure science mission, it definitely has applications in exploration. So if you go back to the Venn diagram on the previous page I showed you, this is clearly an overlap region where kind of exploration is overlapping with pure discovery. And in the technology spinoffs, we're doing a lot of robotic activity on board space station. Um, in Canada, a lot of the uh, robotic activities are starting to go into brain surgery. What's in intriguing there is they're looking at taking um, instruments based on what we have on station. They're building them out, not out of metal, but out of essentially plastic parts so they can actually do surgery inside an MRI device where it's not affected by uh, the magnetic field. And that was, a, a, they took the expertise of what they did in the severe environment of, of space and they've kind of then spun that into the severe environment of an MRI machine to actually do surgery and, and activities there. Um, also, the ultrasound, the big story there is, again, we were able to take our lay practitioners on station and teach them how to do ultrasound. That now has applications in various uh, small countries throughout the world where they don't have good medical conditions. They can actually uh, perform, perform, perform ultrasound on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on women or pregnant women to actually image their children, and they can do that without a doctor doing it. They can actually do it themselves and provide that information back via the telemetry system. So tremendous things here that are, that are really uh, beneficial for us here on the Earth. This is another thing that I think we need to, we need to characterize or think about a little bit more. It turns out this is a protein crystal growth uh, activity. You can see up in the upper left-hand corner, that's a terrestrial vise that actually builds these uh, protein crystal uh, growths, and there's 96 chambers here. It actually mixes the, the chemicals. And then what happens terrestrially is sometimes they had to transport them from one lab to another lab, so they developed a technique to freeze them and then ship them via truck to another lab. So one of our clever folks said, well, maybe if we can freeze them and transport them on a truck, it can't be any rougher than riding the space station on a Soyuz. So why don't we do this same thing? So we did that, and you can see on the right-hand side is Chris Hatfield, and he has one of those little 96 vial samples there. And he actually has a, a little uh, microscope. That's, it's a crude microscope, but a light microscope looking in each one of those 96 little chambers to look at how the protein crystals have grown in space. So what we learned is we didn't have to build a unique device to take to space. We actually could take a terrestrial device that the researchers are very familiar with on the ground. They understand how to do this. And, and we were able to just transport it to space by freezing it and thawing it in space, let the crystals grow in space. 
then use this microscope, and we'll bring a Bretter microscope up later, maybe even some X-ray microscopes to actually look at this material, and then we can return the data down to the ground. So what's unique about this is we figured out a way to reach out to the research community and talk to them in a way that they're familiar with. They're familiar with this equipment. We didn't have to build a unique piece of hardware for our use in space. It was something they could use on the ground, they've used on the ground, we could take it to station, get results back, they get the results back just like they see them from their labs here terrestrially, and they can compare them and bring the data forward. So I think we need to take advantage of this, this kind of activity and try more of these things as we move forward. And then the same thing I show you down in the, in the bottom left-hand corner, it doesn't look like much to you, but what we've done there is we've essentially have, have flown 110 volt AC power outlets to station. So what we determined was there was all this commercial equipment that you would really like to plug into stations. So we used to build all these great uh, power supplies, red bricks, green bricks, and gold bricks, or whatever they are to plug stuff in. And we decided, well, why don't we just actually make something that's actually compatible with everything here on the Earth, at least in the US side. And so we, we went ahead and flew those up. And so now we're able to take devices from the Earth that are typically plug in, and they can just plug in, and they get power immediately on board station. We've also done a lot with wireless uh, pro protocols on station. So we essentially have a wireless land very much like you have here terrestrially on board station, both one on the inside of space station and also one on the outside of space station. So what we're doing is we're making essentially some of the things that we thought we had to do uniquely in space for those particular applications. We found a way to, to leverage off of what's being done uh, terrestrially and to, to then transport it to space. Um, again, some, some more demonstrations that, that are going on. I don't think there's anything here I would talk about. This is as we look forward. As we start taking station as kind of the first step in low Earth orbit, um, as we start thinking about going to exploration distances, you guys have talked about this here in this, in this uh, summit quite a bit. But for example, you know, human health and performance, we've got to get some exercise equipment for the deep space uh, missions, and we need to break that logistics chain. So we need an de exercise device that's compact, it's easy to use, and doesn't take a lot of maintenance. We, you know, uh, Dr. Bogomolov talks about this all the time. We need reliable environmental control and monitoring systems. So it's just a secondary system. You know, we spend a lot of time maintaining our uh, oxygen uh, monitoring systems, um, also microbial growth, those kind of things. We just need to monitor these systems in a way that it's secondary, it just occurs in the systems, and, and we need to do that. And we can demonstrate all these things on station, and then my approach would be to not build a new one for exploration. Whatever we would build on station, it is the exact same thing we go take into exploration. So station will be that first step in exploration. Um, thermal systems, high temperature radiators, we need to look at again to minimize things. A lot of human robotic interfaces, we're doing a lot of activities on the outside of station we used to have to do with spacewalks. We're now able to do uh, with, uh, with essentially ground commanded uh, Dexter on the outside. We're actually to change out a, a RPCM. Uh, this recent uh, uh, EVA where we changed out the pump package, I would think in maybe about a year we should be able to change that pump package out probably robotically and not have to send the crew out to go do those kind of activities. We just did a thing where we had a mock-up of an outside of a spacecraft uh, on the outside of, it's, it's in a little box on station. When my kids were small, I had this busy box that they would play with and turn knobs and move things. Well, we, we created one of those for the Canadian robot on the outside. And, and uh, it actually has a mock-up of an outside of a spacecraft where it actually has a thermal blanket. They actually took a knife, cut three corners of the thermal blanket out, folded it down just like you would on a spacecraft. They cut the ground strap off of the, the thermal blanket. They then effectively manipulated 17 screws around the outside, which is a cover plate, effectively popped the cover plate off, went in, cut a lock wire, removed the B nut, and it attached a refueling coupling and actually transferred ethylene glycol from a tank in, into, the, into the spacecraft. So we did all that robotically commanded from the ground. So we're starting to learn, just like we did on Hubble, where we built unique, crew, unique, unique tools for the crews, we're now building unique tools for the robot on the outside, and it's, it's the same, same kind of thing. And so we'll continue to press that and see where that makes sense. Uh, EVA, um, we have demonstrated that we can really build pretty complex things in space. 
The docking system, we have a, a new international docking standard. It's available on the web. If you build it at interface, you can dock to any spacecraft in space, and we're putting that out, and that's a really nice thing. It's, again, voluntary. Nobody has to adhere to that, but if you would like to have the ability to dock with another spacecraft, you just meet those standards, and, and you're there. And it's not telling you how to design it. It just tells you where the hooks need to be. It tells you where the loads need to be. It's like a USB interface. You know, it can do anything that you want when you plug it in, but the standards are there. You meet the standards, and you can dock. Uh, radiation monitoring, again, you know, we, we've got uh, that, but then I think the other point is really that we need some kind of real-time radiation protection, and, and you've, you've talked about that here. And the last thing is lightweight structures. We're looking at BEAM. That's an inflatable module we'll put on the outside of space station. It'll be interesting to see. We'll inflate that. It's about the size of an airlock. Uh, it's a pretty big volume. It'll be interesting to see what it's like and what we do with the big volume. Typically, we've been limited in volume. We put all our racks on the outside. With these expandable mo modules, the, the equipment goes down the core, and then the big open volume is on the outside. So it'll be interesting from a human factors, behavior standpoint, what's it like to be in this big, different volume and, and see what happens. They also show big promise for thermal and radiation uh, protection. So, so let me just transition a little bit. The way I, I see things as we go forward is, is we're going to start in, in low Earth orbit with a space station, and then I believe we move out. And, and the region I think we move out to is somewhere in the vicinity of the moon. And then when we gain some tools, experience there, we then move from there towards Mars, which is where we ultimately want to go. And, and I look at, we've got this recent thing that, that you've heard about this asteroid mission where we're going to bring an asteroid back to the vicinity of the moon. I don't really think it's all that about bringing the asteroid back as much as it is, is it about getting us experience and operating in the vicinity of the moon. And eventually, it enables us to operate in another region of space. So it, it gets us beyond the, the magnetosphere of the Earth. It gets us out in the higher radiation environment. The durations are what we can do with the Orion capsule today. They're on the order of 22-day kind of missions. We can use the SLS the way it initially comes off the, the first versions that get built. So it really leverages off of everything we're doing now, and it gives us a chance to kind of to break that tie of low Earth orbit and to move out into space. Um, and what we did was we kind of took things we were doing already. We, we had the asteroid identification mission that was going on in the science mission director at its stays. Solar electric propulsion uh, was going on in uh, technology development. We were doing, building the SLS and the MPCV. It ties all those together. We had a capture mechanism, and we can potentially return this asteroid to the vicinity of the moon. This is just a, a nominal mission, and what's exciting to me about this is if you take a look at this, we do a lunar gravity assist to get into this deep retrograde orbit. That's where we put the asteroid. Uh, then we stay there for roughly five days. Then we come back, do another lunar gravity assist, and return to the Earth. We think we could do two EVAs. It takes no changes to Orion. Orion can be depressed. We'll use the launch and entry suits to do this. So again, we didn't have to develop any new suit technology. The only problem and the thing we got to think about is when we're in this deep retrograde orbit, the only way you can get back to the Earth is do this lunar gravity assist to come back. So that's going to say somewhere between five and nine days you're committed. So, so instead of being able to come back in an hour or hour and a half from, from low Earth orbit, you're now going to be stuck there where you are now committed for five days. And I think that's that first tiny small step in breaking the tie back to the home planet. If we can figure out how to get through five days, then we're going to have a fighting chance to get what we have to do when we go to Mars and we're committing to 500 days or, or, or whatever. So this is a great way to experiment, I believe, with this activity. This is what it looks like uh, with the robotic spacecraft. Uh, the asteroid's in that large bag on the right side. We've got a lot of work to do. The EVAs are pretty simple. They're not very sophisticated. They just go out, we just grab a sample and come back. If we're going to do any more sophisticated EVAs, we really need an airlock. We need some kind of crew-tended uh, vehicle in, this, in the vicinity of the moon. It also enables lunar activities. We'll get a chance to see the, the far side of the moon, do some telerobotic activity there. If somebody brings a lander and lands on the moon, it can also be supported. So, so to me, this is a nice step moving forward. I, I don't want to keep treading water. We want to start making some progress in a certain direction. I think this is everything I told you. 
and this is the, the we talk about a capabilities driven framework these are the six things that, I, that we're trying to do we i don't think we're going to get a huge budget so we need to live within our basic budget i want to use high technology readiness levels to to put into these systems once we put them there um, we'll will continue to use them, they all feed forward. So when I build life support, the next generation for space station, that life support will be used in the exploration systems. Um, that's what I mean by multi-use space infrastructure. And then obviously there's gonna be tremendous international partnership and we can leverage off of what we've already done with space station. And this is, this is my first shot out of the box with this thing. You guys can take a look at this and tell me what's wrong with it. I'm, I'm trying to uh, characterize what we do. And, and if you take the outer area of this, this plot, these are all the things that you need to do to go do a Mars mission. So in other words, you need crew duration, you know, 365 plus days. You need, uh, um, you need uh, certain launch capabilities in terms of metric tons. You need certain entry velocities up to, to uh, 13 uh, kilometers per second, et cetera. So each one of these little spokes that goes out are all the technologies. And it, you could do the same thing with the human system, what you need in behavior, what you need in radiation, what you need in other places. And then my point is, I think we can do some of these things with the ISS. And that's that blue shaded region in the upper right hand corner. Um, that's there. Um, this green mission kind of in the middle of this, this plot is, is what I think we can do with the asteroid retrieval mission. And then ultimately the Mars mission needs this entire volume. So what I'm trying to show is by us incrementally, incrementally building capabilities, we can continue to move forward. And, and this is my closing picture for you, and then we'll, we'll get on with the other activity. I think it's gonna occur here in two minutes. This is the Soyuz landing that occurred uh, last Monday. Uh, last Saturday, I was here for a spacewalk with uh, Thomas uh, Marshburn and uh, Chris, uh, and, excuse, yeah, and Chris Cassidy on the outside of the station, working on our ammonia system. Then Tom came home Monday in Kazakhstan in this picture. So, when I when I look at station and I look at what you're doing every day, and I look at the amount of research we're accomplishing, we're getting 35 hours per week. We've actually had two experiments running simultaneously with our new air-to-ground links. We now have extra air-to-ground links. We had two different P. Guys, talking to two different crew members and two different areas of station doing research. We're doing all that while we're doing kind of the routine things of bringing crews up and down on Soyuz and doing all these other EVAs and other activities. So hopefully I gave you some things to think about and I think I ended just about the right time for the, uh, the Antarctic stuff. Thanks. I'll turn it over to uh, Graham, Graham Scott, who is going to uh, tie you into the uh, Antarctic in a very interesting uh, demonstration. Well, thank you, Mr. Abbey. And um, I think when Mr. Abbey and Dr. Wolford asked me to do this, I, I don't know if it had something to do with the fact that I'm a New Zealander and New, New Zealand is very close to the Antarctic and the Royal New Zealand Air Force that I used to be a pilot in actually flies routinely to the Antarctica. Um, but on a more serious note, um, analogs, I, I don't need to really explain to this group, analogs and analog environments are absolutely critical uh, to our work. And of course, the, the Antarctic uh, continent, and in particular, the Amundsen Scott uh, South Pole Station is, is a very extreme example of an analog environment. So I, I hope you will agree at the end of this hour that, that we're going to embark on a bit of an adventure here. I think it's going to be a real treat. Just to give you a quick little roadmap, we've got a couple of videos um, to show you. The first one is just a reminder that medical emergencies do occur in these extreme environments, in this case uh, on the Antarctic co uh, continent. We're going to show you a video of a, of a, a lady who had a, a stroke. Her name is uh, Renee Nicole uh, Dosa. It's a fairly recent event, actually. There was also a, another well-known event of um, a physician, actually, in, on, on the Antarctic continent, Jerry Nielsen, who uh, had uh, detected a lump in her breast during the time uh, of the winter over mission in Antarctica. So the first uh, stanza of this adventure is going to be uh, a reminder of the, of the, the medical uh, 
uh, you know, problems that can arise in these extreme environments. And then uh, NSF, our partners in crime here, have actually put together a really nice video. Um, the physician, uh, Sean, Dr. Sean Roden, is going to give us a tour of the South Pole uh, medical facilities, and he's assisted by nurse practitioner uh, Cassie Scroll. And so you'll see that video as the second video. And then Jason assures me that at uh, uh, 12.47, the satellite link should open up and uh, we will be able to speak live with the uh, folks at the South Pole and you'll be able to ask questions. So I hope that sounds good. Uh, and so Kevin, if you're hearing me, if we could have the first video, uh, the please. The long way to rescue a sick researcher at the South Pole may be nearing an end. Here with that is Betty Wynn. Betty. Good morning, Jeff. Two months ago, Renee Nicole Doser of New Hampshire suffered a stroke. Since then, she's been waiting for a plane to fly her to New Zealand, which is the closest country with advanced medical facilities. Today is it, rescue day in the South Pole for an ailing engineer. When Renee Nicole Doser snapped this photo in February of the last plane of the season to leave the Amundsen-Scott South Pole Station, she had no idea how anxious she'd be for it or any plane's return. That's because in late August, the 58-year-old station manager suffered a stroke and has been trying to get out of Antarctica ever since. Her lawyer sent a letter in early September to Raytheon Corporation telling the contractor Ms. Doser's chances of full recovery are reduced or perhaps impossible if she is not moved quickly. Raytheon denied the request, saying her condition was not life-threatening. The problem is the brutal South Pole conditions make flying dangerous, if not impossible. These pictures were taken in December, summer in Antarctica. But there is no daylight in the Antarctic winter, and temperatures and wind conditions can render planes inoperable. The situation is similar to the case of Dr. Jerry Nielsen, who in 1999 developed breast cancer while at the South Pole. She treated herself for months until a rescue plane was able to land in October and fly her out. Doser hopes she will be on a plane as early as this afternoon. And Doser has worked at the South Pole for about a year now. She said she wanted to take advantage of the good weather window. We do wish her luck, Jeff. All right, Betty, thanks very much. Joining us now is journalist Eric Neeler of Discovery News. He has traveled to the South Pole. Eric, good morning. Hi, Jeff. How you doing? I'm well, thanks. Uh, you've been on this beat for a while. Um, there is a lot of animosity here. Uh, Doser said, quote, I haven't been treated fairly. They're making decisions based on budgets. Isn't a stroke a serious thing? Have you ever seen this kind of animosity? Well, the situation is that it's, it's really a tough call. Um, do you put a lot of people at risk to save one person? Uh, if, this, if, this, if Renee had had a, a, a situation that was easy to diagnose and she would die within a couple days, um, maybe the, uh, the decision would be the other way. Uh, lots of pilots uh, are, are being prepared for this mission, which is going to actually go off here at, uh, just in a few minutes. And um, there's a lot at stake. That, that is one of the, the, the issues here. No one's exactly sure what, what's wrong with her right now. Well, they believe, uh, the, the doctors on the base believe that she did have some kind of stroke. They don't know how serious it is because they don't have the kind of imaging devices, the MRI and CAT scans. Those, uh, that kind of equipment is, is all the way in New Zealand, so they don't really know right now. Talk about the dangers of this mission and this trip. Right. Well, there are three really important things right now for the pilots. Uh, number one is cold. Uh, number two are the winds. And number three is visibility. Right now, you know, I just checked the uh, conditions down there. It's minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit with a wind chill of a negative 104 degrees. Oh. That, now, those temperatures, you know, the folks working down there, the scientists and the other workers, they're inside, right? They're not spending a lot of time outdoors. But for pilots who have to land a plane, refuel, pick up the passengers and any cargo, turn around and fly out again, it's extremely dangerous. And the landing is extremely dangerous. That's right. You can't get out there with a bulldozer to make a nice soft runway, a nice flat runway. There are gusting winds. There are winds that kick up this very fine crystals that are in the air. In fact, that's the, that's the conditions right now. The other thing that we've got to talk about is the uh, jet fuel, the aviation fuel. It freezes at a certain mm. temperature. Now, you can add additives and, so, and, and things in there, but this stuff turns into something like motor oil. And, it, and if that happens, the plane is, you know, 
it's really tough. Eric, this operation costs how much? Well, uh, they, they're telling us that this was part of a regular cargo mission, so they're not releasing any figures. Previous rescues have cost upward of a million dollars when you look at the, all the deployment of individuals uh, you know, across the globe, from Chile to this Rothra base, right. this British base, all the way over to, to New Zealand. It's quite expensive. Eric Neeler, thank you very much. We know you'll be watching, and there's a chance they may have to turn back, but we wish them the best of luck. We appreciate your time this morning. You're welcome. So um, the update is that uh, Ms. Ms. Dosa was successfully airlifted out of uh, the South Pole base uh, to New Zealand. And then fairly rapidly, she actually made her way back to the United States. She was treated at Johns Hopkins uh, uh, by a well-known uh, group, of, group of physicians there. And, and um, she's doing quite well, uh, I understand. Uh, so. Um, what we'd like to do now is, is pivot and um, show you, uh, as I promised, uh, the tour of the, uh, the South Pole um, station, particularly the medical facilities. And, and so, Kevin, if we could have the second video, please. facility. Um, we have a uh, trauma bed that has actually been used for surgical cases. So we've had an appendectomy and a several hernia orifices that were repaired during the winter. So this acts as a surgical suite as well as just a general examination area for our patients. We obviously have the surgical lights uh, for good visibility um, for uh, surgical procedures. Um, we have our suction device. Uh, I'll spin around here. It's our standard Donco suction device that you'll see in typical operating suites and emergency departments. Mayo stand. Uh, we have a Zoll M series uh, critical care unit. It allows us for pacing, uh, defibrillation, monitoring. It has um, pulse ox uh, capabilities and actually CO2 oximetry as well. Um, we have uh, our radiology suite here. And this is, um, as we affectionately call, Blondie. Uh, this is a military uh, trauma x-ray device. And as you can see, it's on wheels. And I'll show you, you can just, just pull it out of the corner. It has some legs that extend down, and we are able to take all our x-ray uh, films here on the table here and then we process them across the room that I'll show shortly. And then we can clean our, our films when we're done. Uh, we have uh, dosimetry devices, so we're um, compliant with all the OSHA regulations. This wall is shielded, so when we take x-rays for PQ or any type of medical issues, there's a hallway behind this where you just saw us earlier in the video. It's shielded um, from any type of radiation exposure. We do have x-ray for uh, dental examinations, and we'll, re we'll very soon have a digital imaging processing center for the, the dental x-ray films as well. This is where we, I said earlier, we clean the, the films after a, an image is shot. We'll process it, and then we'll take the x-ray film out and clean it with a high-intensity light that wipes the, the templates clean. And we do all of this here ourselves. We have a little, uh, just a standard little phlebotomy cart for starting IVs, drawing blood on, on patients. This is our anesthesia and, and trauma cart. Um, we have all our equipment for airway control and capabilities. Uh, we have laryngoscopes and also have a keen vision system, and this is uh, similar to what would be referred to as a, a, a glide scope that we see in, in modern operative suites here. This is all our ALS, ACLS meds uh, in the event of a significant emergency. Everything is 
a perfectly label and it's very easy to find. When you first get here, you'll realize it's uh, the pretty standard with any type of hospital and it's very self-explanatory. Um, more carts with equipment um, and supplies. We have an Accuson Aspen uh, ultrasound device. We have uh, linear probes, or excuse me, a curvilinear probe uh, for abdominal exams. We have a linear probe for doing vascular studies. Um, we have an echocardiography probe. And then we also have a probe in the back that can be set up uh, quite quickly for either prostate or uh, pelvic uh, ultrasound examinations. All the images are stored in the device and then it's transmitted across the room here and will be sent to UTMB where they have radiology gives us secondary read on all our images that we capture here. Um, 12 lead EKG that we can transmit to, EK, to UTMB as well. Um, quite capable and gives us good uh, studies for echo, uh, electrocardiography uh, requirements. Again, our bins with more uh, equipment. Um, we have full orthopedic capabilities for splinting uh, up to casting patients um, for any type of orthopedic problems. Um, we have uh, more supply bins where we keep all our surgical tools. We sterilize all our own equipment with the autoclave that you'll see later in the, in the tour. Um, standard otoscope, ophthalmoscope, stethoscopes. Um, we have a Welch Allen ProPac uh, monitor. Um, one thing you won't see in the tour, but we have a trauma cache that's on the other end of the station that duplicates a lot of this equipment so that in the event there was a problem with the clinic, we still have redundancy for the station with a lot of this equipment down on the other side of the station. One thing I didn't show you earlier, we use an Eagle impact ventilator. So for any type of critical care, this is the, the device we use for placing patients on uh, mechanical ventilation. Um, standard IV infusers, you know, trauma ambu bag. I'm going to go ahead and swing these lights out so you can get a little better view without this causing such an obstruction. And this is a perfect opportunity to lead in to show you that the rest of the radiologic processing center that we have here. Lights for the operative's lamps are here. This is our radiology processing center. Um, we have a dedicated computer system that does just for the, the images that come from the ultrasound. We take the standard <clears throat> x-ray plates that you're used to when we take our films. We unlatch them out of the, car out of the carriage, place the film into this device that will process it and it's digitized onto this computer screen right here, right next to it. From there, we can send any type of uh, images digitally straight to Galveston for radiology interpretation. This is a JetMed device that allows us to um, <coughs> video any type of patient or if we're having to do an operation, we can send high fidelity imaging through this device. This is our VTC device where we have um, our weekly telecons with Galveston. Um, it's connected into a conference room in Galveston, Texas and we'll give our weekly reports through a, an audiovisual uh, presentation. This is the monitor that allows us to see them and for them to see us. Um, as you notice, we've got oxygen tanks uh, throughout the clinic. <clears throat> this is our warming cabinet where we can keep uh, you know, warm ultrasound uh, conduction gel, blankets, IV fluids medications. Again, more bins and they're all perfectly and easily marked so you don't feel like you have to run around trying to find the exact uh, drawer without having to open all of them up. 
Um, we have a physiotherapy device. Uh, this is an ultrasound as well as a TENS unit. Uh, we do our own physical therapy here. We have a physical therapist in McMurdo that will help us <clears throat> and give us uh, prescriptions if we have any questions on whether there's a therapy that needs to be given. This is also our, our um, Bovi um, bipolar coagulation device for any type of operative procedures. We keep that over here and then we need it. We set it, re rearrange the clinic in such a way that it's more of an operative suite than a clinic. We have a dental chair <coughs> and full dental um, equipment and capabilities. Uh, we have an ultraviolet wand that allows us to use some of the more modern uh, plasters and sealants uh, for dental emergencies and cavity repair. Another cabinet with all our dental supplies. Um, this is our communications station in the event we have a mass casualty event or have a patient that, um, or multiple patients that we require um, communications throughout the station. And this is where we conduct all our communication requirements. So, so this is the main part of the clinic where we do a vast majority of the, the patients we see and evaluate. Uh, we do have some other rooms in the back around the corner that I'll show you here shortly. Okay, so as we're coming around the corner from the main area of the, the clinic, we have a slip lamp so we can do all types of ophthalmologic examinations and evaluations and treatments. Um, we do have, uh, everybody has the standard bathroom with the, we also have hydrotherapy equipment, so if anybody needs any physical therapy with uh, uh, a jacuzzi treatment, we can do that here. Um, like I said, just standard hospital bathroom. We do have the capability of monitoring patients over a 24, 40 hour period, and so we have two uh, um, ward beds, if you will, and uh, we do keep people over here overnight on a fairly regular basis. Once again, we have complete oxygen supplies for both uh, ward beds, monitoring equipment from the clinic we bring right over. And probably the most important thing about this uh, ward is that you have a perfect view of the, the South Pole right out the window, something we never get tired of. We keep the, this area here for our, our striker um, elevator chair as well as our, our striker trauma bed. In the event we have some type of event in the station, we can load all our uh, trauma equipment on this stretcher and get it mobilized to wherever the patient is so we can get them back here in a safe and a timely fashion. Our historical cabinet with some of the uh, medical equipment we've found all the way back from when the Navy first uh, opened up uh, the South Pole as a permanent presence uh, for human exploration. And then around the corner, we come into the, the doctor's office. Um, here we have our obstetric and gynecologic uh, uh, bed for doing any type of uh, gynecologic uh, evaluations and procedures. We have pulmonary function test equipment that we keep in the back here. Um, it's, it's stowed and it's stored, but um, it's all set up and we can do our pulmonary function tests here in this office as well. Um, we keep all our controlled substances locked in our, our safes. This is a patient uh, file cabinet, which hopefully very soon will be going to an electronic medical record and this will be just used for more storage. Uh, we have other storage bins for just uh, simple uh, equipment, office supplies. We have an extensive library, which has really been nice. Uh, the fact that we don't have satellite coverage, but about six hours a day, you can't utilize the internet as much as you would uh, back when you're at home. So we really rely on the text um, quite a bit for cases that we have some questions on. Uh, this is just a standard office for myself. and. It's pretty comfortable, and then get another small little view of the geographic South Pole. And that's it for the office. I think now what I'll do is I'll turn you over to my colleague uh, Cassie Squirrel, and she'll show you the rest of our clinic and facilities. Hi, my name is Cassie, and I'm going to show you in this room here is where we keep some of our trauma gear. We have our stretcher and our gamma bag, and we have probably about 
five or six bags we have in case there is an emergency. Uh, and then that will go to the lab area and show you our workplace. Right here is the work area. This is where the nurse practitioner or the physician assistant will be working. We do all our labs here. Um, we do have the QBC, which we do our uh, CBC. And we have this uh, centrifuge where we could do type and cross, and we can also uh, send our labs out if we need to. And in this cabinet here, you'll find an array of, we could do your analysis. Uh, pregnancy tests, and we can do influenza A and B, strep, and all the way up to HIV in, uh, for chlamydia. Let's go on through some more, and it's kind of set up with some um, lab tubes. And on through here, we also can do uh, check, we have a breathalyzer if we need to here at the pole to check for alcohol levels. And right over here, we have a nice uh, piccolo, which we do all our um, chem, uh, CMPs or BMPs. We can also do liquid testing here without sending anything out. This is our uh, microscope, and we have a refrigerator to keep everything that needs to be um, taken care of for us, medication and some of our testing. Now, this area is also our pharmacy. Over here, we have our um, OTCs. And then back into here, which is a little couple, we do our autoclave. And we also have all our medication, oral medications in the cabinets that are um, alphabeticalized, generic. And then we also keep our IV and IM medications in this um, box here. And up above, we have it, they're all labeled for tropicals, or excuse me, tropicals and um, OBGYN. And then again, down here for the IV and IM medication. So we have an extensive pharmacy here that does quite well. And that is it in this area. So. Okay, well I hope you've enjoyed our tour. We really enjoy working here. It's a wonderful facility and it's, it's very well uh, managed. Uh, if you have any questions, you know, just contact us at UTMB and they'll be glad to help you. Okay, well, uh, very impressive, and as I think you can see, we have actually, I believe, in talking with our technical crew, established contact with the South Pole. Um, is that Dr. Bradshaw? Dr. Yes, sir. Good. Uh, my name is uh, Graham, Dr. Bradshaw. It's uh, wonderful we're able to do this. So thank you. And we're, we're, what we're going to do, uh, Dr. Bradshaw, is we have, uh, I don't know, may, maybe 100 or more people here in the room who have just uh, had a tour of the facility. Uh, Dr. Roden uh, and nurse, nurse practitioner Scroll gave us a beautiful tour. So I'm sure we have a lot of questions. Uh, I have some. Uh, I'm sure my colleagues have some. Um, so, uh, Melissa, are you going to be passing the microphone around? I, I can certainly get us going here and I'm sure there'll be plenty of other questions. So, um, Dr. Bradshaw, I'm curious if you can comment on the types of neurocognitive disorders that you see, obviously, particularly during the, the winter over period. Uh, what, 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 what is the spectrum of neurocognitive uh, disorders that, that you would run into um, in, at the South Pole Station? Okay, uh, I'm looking to see if I can see Dr. Dingus in the audience because he, he may have a follow-up uh, question or Dr. Basna, but uh, while, we're, while we're getting the uh, microphone, um, the capabilities that you have are very extensive. I'm curious if there are plans to add additional capabilities or if you would like additional capabilities like MRI, for example. Can you, can you comment on how you're going to augment the capabilities going forward?
Okay. Do we have uh, do we have some questions from my colleagues? Who, who has a question? Dr. Dingus, go ahead, Dr. Dingus. Thank, thank you, Graham. Um, <clears throat> I had a question about uh, gender differences. Do you notice that uh, um, males or females, one of one of the genders, copes better with the confinement and isolation, or is it pretty even between the two? Yes, thank you. We have a question over here. Yes. Yeah, um, so obviously you have a, a relatively well-equipped area in a very small space. What, what kinds of things are, are, are frustrating for you? Uh, I, I almost tempted to ask you your mortality rate, but you know, how many times do things come up that you can't really handle and wish you could? And you know, I guess those fall into two categories. Some of them you maybe could handle if you had a little bit more, and some of them you just can't handle unless you have an MRI or that sort of thing. Other questions from my colleagues? Um, while we're waiting uh, for the microphones to be passed, I'm curious if you can just comment about when the uh, last flight um, leaves for the season and then when the first one comes in. And then the second part to my question is, can supplies actually be dropped uh, potentially by, by parachute if, if needs be, uh, pharmaceuticals or, or even devices? Can you comment on that? So, Dr. Bradshaw, um, when do you when do you see the last flight, and when does the first one come in uh, in the year? a long time. Okay, we have a question here. Yes, sir. Could you share with us something about the spectrum of, of uh, if you will, employees who are overwintering there? In other words, age range, uh, physiological state. Could someone with, for example, with uh, well-controlled hypertension be in your pool of uh, potential patients? Uh, yes, sir. We have one person here who has well-controlled hypertension, and uh, the people in Denver do, and the people at 
University of Texas Medical Branch to Galveston do a process of pre-qualifying, and they use the NSF's criteria about who can and who cannot come here. And so, in terms of high retention, we have people that are well-controlled that are here. We have one person who came with well-controlled depression, and one of the vicissitudes we faced was that we're only allowed to bring six months of medicines here, and people are supposed to mail the remaining months that they need here. Well, due to logistics and problems with getting planes in, we have at least one person whose medicines did not arrive, and so we're having to improvise to cover their needs. Okay, uh, Dr. Bouchard, you have a question. Uh, thanks, Graham. Uh, Dr. Branch, I, I had a question. I'm a, I'm a stroke neurologist at Baylor College of Medicine, and we often do telemedicine re with remote locations. And you mentioned that you have thrombolytics but no CAT scan. And I think that having a CAT scan is an essential part, not only for brain imaging but for body imaging. There are some portable CAT scanners, and we use one of them uh, where we can just bring it into the patient's room, and it's very small. In fact, they're putting it on an ambulance now in Germany to, um, so that the EMS can go and assess the patient with a CAT scan and then can do telemedicine and give thrombolytics without the patient actually coming to the hospital. So it seems like something like that technology would be invaluable for the different problems such as trauma or other uh, systemic and brain problems there. I would certainly agree with you. I wasn't aware that that was available, but uh, practicing in 2013 without a cat scanner is like being without a stethoscope. Uh, and that resource, we've had one case of diverticulitis here, and we're able to treat it medically. But having a cat scan would certainly be a massive step forward in terms of our abilities here. Um, Dr. Bradshaw, I'm interested on a more personal level. Is this your first uh, sojourn at the uh, South Pole, or are you are you uh, very experienced at this? Do you have experience uh, working in, in similar, you know, kind of extreme environments? Have you been, for example, to Mount Everest or, or any, anything close to this? The closest I've come to Everest is from my boss, Dr. Karaziski. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I'm not seeing any more questions, so I'll keep asking some. I'm, I'm curious about, uh, obviously the temperature uh, can be extreme. Um, how often, for example, do, do you go outside? Is it, is it never or occasionally? Um, can you give me an idea of how often people are actually outside the facility? Three weeks we went out built an igloo. You know, that was uh, 
80 below, with about 160 below with the wind chill. The physiologic altitude is about 10,600 feet. The actual altitude is about 9,300. And I spent some time in what we'll call water, which is 10 below 52, so I'm comfortable with altitude. Okay. Dr. Bradshaw, does the, is the humidity also very low, and does that have any medical consequences? It does. Uh, on the minor end of things, people get split in their fingers, which I've seen in the States, cold weather, dry weather, thumbs, fingertips will start splitting. Uh, when you go outside and breathe in the super cold air, you know, air, sometimes people will develop a cough and they just treat that symptomatically. Uh, we have a greenhouse which people can go in 724 and people will take their books and their iPads and their guitars and sit in that which is a more human environment which probably helps us stay healthy while they're here. We're coming to the end of our time, folks, in a couple of minutes. So if anyone does have a question for Dr. Bradshaw, there's a question here, I think. Go ahead. Uh, how many of the injuries you see are related to um, ventures outside of the base versus uh, typical health problems that people have um, inside? Very good question. Uh, essentially, no injuries so far this season from outside activities. The most dangerous place in the station is the gym and the weight room. And so people working out and straining their backs or things like that, which I'm grateful to say that's the extent of the severity. Um, the person who's putting on this conference can give you my email. And if any of you have questions, you can email me directly, and I would be glad to answer your questions if they come up throughout my stay here. I'd be very, very uh, glad to answer any questions that come up. Excellent. So, Dr. Bradshaw, I got one last question for you. I'm I'm curious. I've been I've, nothing like what you're doing, but I've I've done survivals and things like that. And what I, I wonder in your case, what is the one thing you're really looking forward to doing when you when you get off the ice? What are you looking forward to? Is it a certain type of food or a certain activity? What, what, what's the What are you really looking forward to? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's very kind. <laughs> um, it is a beautiful country. Well, look, it's been a delight uh, and a real pleasure, I think, for us to spend, you know, 15 or 20 minutes with you and um, stay safe. And thank you very, very much. Okay. Thanks, everybody. I think, uh, Mr. Abbey or Dr. Alford, are we... I'll, I'll turn it back over to, uh, I believe we have a session starting in a few minutes, so. Panels now, yeah, I think we're right, right on time almost, right? Yep.